night my eyes found yours shining like the sun striding through the fear the prince of peace met me there Like the sunlight piercing through the dark, the Prince of Peace came and broke into my heart. The violent cross, the empty grave, and in your light I found grace. Tearing through the night, running on the storm, staring down the fight, my eyes found yours, shining like the sun, striding through my fear, the Prince of Peace met me there. surrounds me when my thoughts wage war when night screams terror they a voice will roar come death or shadow god i know your light will meet me there when fear comes knocking there you'll be when day breeds trouble, there you hold my heart. Come storm or battle, God, I know your peace will meet me there. Oh, be still, my heart. That you are God. Oh, fear no evil, for I know you.
majesty, your grace compels my soul to love and draw in close. And I lift my hands and sing, surrender everything.
and we celebrate are celebrating throughout this week, Father. Thank you for the events that were so significant. So eternally changing. So liberating. To all those that understand what took place. I thank you for this time of reflection. I thank you for this time of separation for your people. As we see your passion displayed on our behalf. So we trust your Holy Spirit to move, to bring to remembrance some things and maybe teach us some things we didn't know, Lord. But we trust to grow in you today. Thank you for the vessel you will use. And I thank you for all that will take place here today. And even this offering, Father, we offer it up unto you. We thank you for your divine provisions, for every avenue you use to bless your people, for every job we have. ever grateful to honor your house with our giving. In Jesus' gracious name we pray. Amen. Amen. saints just pray father we thank you for this evening lord we thank you for the gathering of the saints lord father you said where two or three are gathered that you are in our midst so we thank you lord for your holy spirit that is present holy spirit you are the teacher lord and i decrease so that you may increase father god everything that you've put in my heart to say i will say i will not add or subtract to your holy word father Lord, I know I am the donkey bringing in the king, Father. So I humble myself before you, Lord, and I say, have your way, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yeah. You may be seated. Thank you, Lord. So this past Sunday, we celebrated Palm Sunday as Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the colt that has never been ridden before, showing a sign of his humility. So I want to just keep on that timeline 
And before he came into to Jerusalem, as the people were celebrating him, there was a reason. There was a, we know that Jesus did many, many miracles. Everywhere he went, he healed. He healed lepers. He healed the blind. He gave hearing to the deaf. He, he healed the lame, those that had, um, you know, infirmities with their legs and their arms. So the fame of Jesus was out there. But then there was one that put the cherry on the cake, if you will. And it was the, the um, raising of Lazarus from the dead. Amen? So this is why there was so much excitement because he just finished raising Lazarus from the dead. So everybody wanted to just celebrate him and know that he was someone special. They viewed him as um, a prophet. Some called him a prophet. Some, you know, they, they knew he was a messenger from God. They knew that there was something special about him. They knew that this was no ordinary man. And the fact that he raised somebody from the dead that nobody can deny that this man was special. Amen. And so these people were, were honoring him and throwing down the palms and throwing down their coats as he rode in. But before that, there was a feast that um, the people wanted to have for him. So it was a few of Jesus' friends and some Pharisees were there. And this takes place in Bethany. And if you turn to um, Matthew 26, chapter 6, I mean 26, verse 6. So the, the title is The Anointing at Bethany. And the first thing I do is look up what a word means. And Bethany means the house of the afflicted. Affliction means pain and suffering. And it is funny that that's the place where Jesus was anointed. Amen. So this place in Bethany was around two miles from uh, Jerusalem, next to the Mount of Olive, where Jesus used to go up and pray. But it's funny because it was not in Jerusalem. It was a little walk away, two miles away. But it was called the place of affliction because that's where they send the people who had leprosy to go to, the people who were diseased. That's the town where they went. They kept them away because they were afflicted. Amen. So there you get a, a little inkling of um, this town, its name. So... This starts off at six and it says, and where Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper. Right away, you see that Simon was a leper because if he still was, was sick with leprosy, nobody could visit him. So Jesus had healed Simon the leper. So the dinner was at his house, right? A woman came to him having an alabaster flask, a very costly fragrant oil and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. There's a couple of things that I want to point out. This alabaster, like I said, I like to get into the details. Alabaster is a marble-like stone that contains an, uh, the oil, the fragrant oil, pure, unspoiled, untainted, uncontaminated. And it's not porous so that it won't seep out. So this fragrant oil was contained in this alabaster box. And it is said that in the Temple of Solomon, it was the, the columns were made out of alabaster. So this refers to the temple, which Jesus says, destroy this temple and in three days I'll rise it up. So when she breaks the alabaster box, it's symbolic of the breaking of his body, of the breaking of the temple, right? That he will rise up again. All right, when she does this, this points, she's pouring this anointing oil. Let me just go backtrack. This anointing oil was said to cost a year's wages, 300 denarii. So it wasn't any, anything that, you know, like we go to Macy's and we could pick out an oil, you know, fragrant oil. Some are cheap, some are expensive. This was something that cost a whole year. 
This is more like a dowry. It's like when a bride was going to get married, she saved this oil for that occasion. It wasn't to be used for anything else. Because when Lazarus was in the tomb for four days, why didn't she use the anointing oil on him? She saved it because she's symbolic of the bride. She's symbolic of the bride and Jesus is the groom. And she poured this oil upon her groom. Amen? So that's the meaning behind that. When she pours the oil on him, now only there's four anointings. There's an anointing of the king, of the priest, of the prophet, and anointing the dead. When she anointed him, she was saying, he is Messiah, king. Messiah and Christ mean anointed one. Amen? So she was, again, it is pointing towards who Christ is. He is Messiah, king. The one that the prophets foretold, the one that came to deliver his people from the bondage of the enemy, from the snares of Satan. She is declaring, this is my king. I am his bride. She's identifying with him as his bride, that he belongs to her and she belongs to him. Amen? Thank you, Lord. Excuse me. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> I'm so sorry, I'm so nervous. <laughs> As she identifies with him, she's telling the world, this is my king, this is my beloved. You know, we sing that song, my beloved is the most beautiful, amen? So she's identifying with him. When you identify with Christ, you're saying that he's your Lord. When he's your Lord, you're saying that he is the one who rules in your heart. He's the one who's seated on the throne room of your heart. And the way she poured out this expensive oil on him is the way she viewed him. This is the same Mary. Now, they don't, they don't give her name here, but in other Gospels, they give her name, and it's Mary. It's Lazarus' sister, right? And we know her when Ma Martha and Mary were cooking, and Jesus came. Mary left Martha, and she went to sit at his feet because she wanted to hear what the Master had to say. So you see her relationship that she always wanted to be close to Jesus. She always submitted herself to him. Coming down and worshiping, coming down to his feet means a sign of worship, a sign of surrender, a sign of submission. That she wanted to hear what the master said because his words are life. And she wanted to hear those words. We remember in the, in the Mount of Transfiguration, when the disciples were there with Jesus, that the Lord had to speak to some. He said, this is my son, listen to him, amen. The Lord didn't have to do that to Mary. She, her heart was postured to hear what he had to say because his words are life. Amen? This is the same Mary that... Um, so she, she bowed at his feet, right? Then when Lazarus was dead and they told her, Jesus is here, she ran out quickly and she fell at his feet again. So she trusted him, she listened to him, and now when she's anointed him, and another um, gospel, it says that she fell at his feet to anoint him. And she also anointed his feet, amen? She's saying, I surrender. I surrender my life to you. You are my king. I belong to you, you belong to me. There was nothing that she was holding back, nothing. And that's the way God wants us to worship him. Your, uh, your worship has to cost you. Worship has to come from, from the innermost. It has to be costly because he gave his best for us, so we got to give our best to him. Amen? Amen? 
So when the Lord, there's a scripture in John 12, 25, it says, he who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And let's just keep reading um, on Matthew 26. So we're now, okay, she, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when Jesus saw it, I'm sorry. But when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much more and given to the poor. But when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. But you have the poor with you always, but me you do not have always. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will be told as a memorial to her. She's, she's, when we think of Mary, we think of the anointing that took place, that what she's done for Jesus. Jesus is recording it in the gospels, and wherever this is preached, we're going to hear the story of the alabaster box. We're going to hear about this worship that was so extravagant. The Lord calls it extravagant worship. This is the type of worship that the Lord wants of, from us. Amen. And now we're looking at, at Judas, right? Now we know that Jesus always had enemies. We know that the Pharisees were his enemies. They were always trying to entrap him. They were always sending their disciples saying, ask him this, ask him that. They said to him, ask him, is it lawful for us to give our taxes? And when he told them, and whose face is on there? And they said, Caesar. And he said, give to Caesar what's due to Caesar. And they marveled. They didn't know what to say. So they had to stop asking him questions. But they were always trying to entrap him. They were always looking to try to murder him. And now we see that we have enemies that are in plain sight. And we have enemies amongst us that we don't know. Now, we are carnal, we are human, so we don't know, they used to call them uh, frenemies, right? We don't know who our enemies are in our inner circle. We, they may be laughing in your face, they may be, you know, with you, eating with you, because wasn't Judas eating, eating with Jesus? Sharing bread, breaking bread, and Jesus dipping it in there and giving it to him. He walked with Jesus, he saw the miracles, he went to the synagogues with Jesus. And this same Judas, when Jesus anointed the 12, remember when he anointed the 12 to go out in power and cast out demons and heal the sick? Judas was amongst them. He was anointed. He had the power of God on him, and he went out and he cast out demons and healed the sick because Jesus gave him that. Jesus, knowing who he was, didn't stop it. Jesus did not. Uh, address it at the moment because he needed to fulfill scripture. When we have enemies in front of us, you know, we keep them far from us, right? We don't want to be bothered with them. But Jesus, he knew who this enemy was all the time, and yet he didn't cast them out. Because when you have an enemy, let them see you succeed. Let them see you be diligent. That enemy was designed to take him out of his purpose, right? To crucify the Lord of glory. But when you have an enemy, let them see that Christ is in you. If God is for you, who can be against you? Amen? So this enemy, the Lord saw him and he kept him there and he couldn't come against him. So, excuse me. Thank you, Father. I want you to turn to John 6, 64. Just so that you could see. But there are some among you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning, who they were, who did not believe, and who would not betray, and who would betray him. So he already knew who would betray him, and he was at his table. Amen. So why we ask, why was Jesus allowing this? Maybe he was allowing it so that we 
have an example that we're going to have enemies. Maybe he was allowing us to show us that we have to love our enemies. Amen. That he will fight our battles for us. That they may think they're getting over on us, but they're not. You know, um, we know that Joseph um, had enemies. His own brothers were his enemies, right? And they sold him. They sold him into slavery for 20 pieces of silver. And Judas sold Jesus into slavery in, to the... Um, to the Pharisees for 30 pieces of silver. And that, if we read in Exodus, it says 30 pieces of silver was the price you paid for a slave. So we're seeing that Jesus was a slave to who? He, this, the Bible says that he who wants to be the greatest must be a servant to all. Amen? So he was our slave. He was our servant. He did that for us. He gladly became that slave so that we wouldn't have to be slaves, so that we can be free from the bondage of the enemy. Amen? Let's turn to Matthews 22.10. We know that we're going to have the enemies, like I said. Hmm. So this is the parable about the, the feast that the king is preparing. And there, the first time he sent him out, they ignored him. They didn't want to come. So then he had to send out a second invitation. Now, this is the second invitation in verse 10. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And the king said to the servant, bind him hand and foot, take away, take him away and cast him into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called, but few are chosen. So that we see that when Ju Judas was called, he was called into the 12. He was called in to be a disciple, but his heart was never there. He never believed Jesus. Jesus knew he never believed in him. And he was like that. He was like that guest at the wedding feast. He didn't have on that robe. That robe signifies the righteousness of Christ. That signifies Jesus is my Lord. When they put on that robe, that means I belong to him. That means, you know, he paid the price for me, but Judas didn't come with that robe. He never believed. So it was obvious that he stuck out because he wasn't clothed in righteousness, amen? And that's why the enemy was able to come in and infiltrate his heart. It says, that he was, he was the, the treasurer and he would steal money from the treasury. So when they, Jesus kept predicting that he was going to die, that he was going to be crucified, he probably said, you know what? I might as well gain something out of this and just give him up because he's going to die anyway. Everybody's thinking he's going to be the conquering king and he's going to set Israel free, but he's going to die. He keeps saying he's going to die. So let me seize this opportunity. And that's why he sold him because in his heart was greed. In his heart was the love of money, which is the root of all evil. He wanted to, he was just self-seeking is why he was there with Jesus, right? When we see them at, at, uh, at Bethany, we see that only Mary was there worshiping. The men weren't worshiping. What Mary did was break in tradition. Women weren't allowed to come into that place. But she broke tradition. She came in and she didn't care what they said. She didn't care about tradition. She wanted to worship. She wanted to pour out her oil upon Christ. She heard what he said. He said he was going to be crucified. And she said, this is my last opportunity to see him. I'm going to give him all I got. Now, you would think that Lazarus, the one who he resurrected, would be at his feet. But Lazarus wasn't at his feet. Okay, Simon the leper, he wasn't at his feet. All the apostles, none of them were at his feet. It was just her. She understood because she was hearing, because she spent time at his feet, because she truly worshiped him. You know, sometimes 
You could talk to somebody and they're not, they're not really getting your heart. The words are there, but they're not understanding. She captured, she discerned, and she knew that she had to express her love because this was going to be the last time that she saw him. Amen? So when we look at, Ju at the other guys who didn't worship, who didn't pour out their love upon Jesus, there's some people holding back. What, what is keeping us from worshiping? What is keep, people, keeping us from pouring out everything, our best? He doesn't want half of you. He wants all of you. He doesn't want some of you. He wants all of you. Amen. And that's why it, they expressed the cost of this oil because it was so grand. And this is what she gave that belonged to her. So what is holding us back? Sometimes it's fear. Sometimes it's worry. Sometimes it's, it's um, our job. Sometimes it's too many distractions in the world that are going on that are holding us back from giving the Lord the worship that he truly desires from us. So when, when we come to the Lord, we should say, Lord, what's in me that's holding back my worship? If we, we go to Psalms 139, 23, 24, it says, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there's any offense, any offensive way in me, and lead me into the way everlasting. Amen? So ask yourself that question. What is holding back my worship? What is holding me back from giving my all to the Lord? Because he wants his all, because he gave his all, because he was the one who was afflicted for us. He took away the punishment that we so justly deserve, and he took it upon himself. And yet we're just giving him some of us and not all of us. And he's asking, I want more of you. And as we remember what he did, I mean, we, we can cry during worship, you know, we can have a lot of religious activities. We see that Judas did all the religious activities, but his heart was far from Jesus, amen? And so we can't say that we're doing these religious activities and say, that's my worship, because that's not what he's looking at. He's looking at the heart. He's looking at what you value. And, and what, how you value Jesus will determine how you worship Jesus, amen? She gave him extravagant worship. It means extravagant means extreme, excessive, elaborate. And we noticed that they said, they said to her, why are you doing that? We could have gave that money to the poor. They ridiculed her for her extravagant worship. Not everybody's going to understand why you love Jesus the way you love Jesus. Not everybody's going to understand. When you're extravagant, when you're excessive about the Lord, people want to shut you up just like they wanted to shut up um, like Mary. They didn't want her to do that. Get away from here. Like, look at her. What is she doing? You know, she's coming in here. And the, the attention should have been on Jesus. But now they're putting the attention on what they could do with this oil. They, the haters always want to take the attention away from Jesus. And so she, she was the one who broke that cycle in that room to say, this is what true worship is, amen? It is putting all of your affection, all of your love, everything that you have, it's going to cost you to follow Jesus because you have to deny yourself and count the cost and follow him. And that's what she did. She denied herself. Coming down to his feet, worshiping and surrendering is denying herself. Being ridiculed by the men is, you know, denying herself. She didn't care. Sometimes it's going to cost you humiliation. Co-workers might say, you're a Jesus freak. Co-workers may not understand why you do the things the way you do. Why you let them talk to you like that? Why do you put up with all of that? Why are you still that, treating that person kind when they know they hate you, when you know they hate you? And so you're doing this because you love Christ. And you're saying, I'm going to be obedient to the point of death because this flesh has to die.
to show my love for Christ. When Christ is in me, then the world will know how to love. Amen? So the cost, it's going to cost us. And it will cost us sometimes even relationships. Amen? Thank you, Lord. There's a scripture verse in Genesis 50, 20 that says, For as you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about the present outcome that many people would be kept alive. So this was what Joseph said to his brothers as they sold him into slavery. And there's no plan that God doesn't know. God doesn't, doesn't, He's aware of everything. He's aware of how people treat you. He's aware of what's in their heart. And he's using it for the good. He's using it so that others may see Christ in you, right? And so when they, when they sold Joseph, they thought they were doing something evil. But then it turns out that he's the one who, who, um, who got the food in, in time of famine and saved everybody, right? So now here they are trying to kill Jesus. And what? Because of him, now many are saved. Because unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground, there can be no, no, no outcome, no produce, right? There can no spring forth more. So he had to die so that more could come, so that we, more brethren could come into the house. Amen? So what the enemy intended for evil, God turns it around for good. Amen? And we see that even in the life of Jesus. There is nothing that you suffer that doesn't have a point that doesn't have a, a lesson in it. The sufferings always have a greater good. There's a greater weight of glory coming from the, the suffering that we partake of. Amen? Thank you, Lord. So let's express our extravagant love. Amen? Let's express our love for, for the Lord. If you just want to come to the altar, close your eyes, and just tell Jesus how much he means to you. Remember, the way you view Jesus, how do you view him? Is he your healer? Is he your peace? Is he your provider? Is he your counselor? He's all these things to us. How are you viewing him? He is so much. He's the, he's the comforter, right? Amen? He gives us everything that we have need of, everything that we have need of. He provides it for us. How are we viewing him? Are we seeking him? So what we can gain from him, are we seeking him just because we love him? And we want to say thank you. It's a heart of gratitude that caused Mary to come to her feet, that caused Mary to pour out extravagant worship that people were like in awe of. And there was a point of humility. When, when she falls down at his feet, that is humility. Uh, humility is fear of the Lord. The Bible says that, humility. What is fear of the Lord? That means you're in wonder, you're in awe, you're in reverence. You want to honor. So a sign of surrender is the fear of the Lord. It means he has esteem in your heart. And when you esteem the Lord in your heart, there is nothing that he won't do for you. He will move mountains for you because you place your affection upon him. Amen? I don't know. It's, um, you guys over there? Can you play my beloved? Yeshua. As we think about this season, you know, we think about the whipping, we think about the beard being pulled, we think about the crown of thorns and piercings and rejection. And that's something that it's heart-wrenching. 
But when you think that he did it for you, he did it for me, that he went through great lengths just so that we can have a relationship. There's something that we cannot take lightly, that we have to give that extravagant love that was given to us. We have to respond with extravagant worship. Amen. So if you want to just come to the altar and just pour out your love, pour out your best offering, pour out your best worship, pour out that extravagant love that you have for him. Because she didn't care who was in the room. Don't care who's in the room. Don't care who's going to ridicule you. Don't care who's, who's watching you. This is between you and the Lord. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you, Lord. Bless you. Can you turn it up higher? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Father. We worship you, Jesus. We thank you that you are Lord, that you are King. Thank you, Father. We lift you high, Father, in our hearts, in our life, Lord. You reign supreme. You are the one, you are the creator. Lord, because of you, we live and breathe and have our being, Lord. There is none like you, Father God. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus.
was never a Something that's casual, something that's ordinary, something that we don't esteem. And that's what Judas did. He made the sacred, the holy, and he made it common. Guard your hearts, because it's so easy to fall in love with other things. It's so easy to prioritize other things. It's so easy just to say, yeah, I believe, but you got to put your whole heart in it. And it's going to take work. It's going to take dying to self, and it's going to take a commitment. It's going to take humility. It's going to take surrender. It's worth it. Lord, so Father, we thank you for the gift of Jesus. We thank you for our Messiah. We thank you for our King. We thank you for the Holy One who was anointed by you, Father. He's the one who takes the sins of the world away. Father, we thank you for Yeshua. We thank you for our Lord Jesus. We thank you that we have salvation, Lord, in him. We thank you that our name is written in the Lamb's book of life. We thank you that we don't walk alone, Father, that you are with us every step of the way. We thank you that you have made your abode in our bodies, oh God, that we are your temple, that we carry power. Father, you said as Christ is, so are we. And when we say Christ, we say anointed. So we say that we are anointed and appointed, hallelujah, to do the works that Jesus did, to cast out demons and to heal the sick. So Father, we thank you for that great power that you have bestowed upon us, Lord, but it's not the power that we seek for. It's not the power that we hunger for. It is you, Lord. You are our portion. You are our treasure. You're the one we want to esteem. You're the one that we want to allow to be Lord over our hearts to reign and to rule, and we subject ourselves to you, Lord. We allow you to lead us. We allow you to guide us, Father God. When we call you Lord, that means that we've given up We've given up ownership, that we've given up the right to rule, and we've allowed you to rule us, Lord. So I thank you, Father. I thank you. We make Jesus Lord over our life. You are Lord over our life. Have your way in us. We surrender it all to you today. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. How many extravagant worshipers are in the house? I mean, not casual, right? There's a distinction there. Not a casual, but an extravagant worshiper. When you lay it all down. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. You know, one of the... God's commitment was simply to sh reveal his heart to us, right? Because that's what he's after, our hearts. And he paid an amazing price to show you how much he loved he loves you and what he was willing to do on our behalf and we need to celebrate that i think it helps us really put a lot of stuff in perspective because um, we can come up with a lot of excuses you know but it all when it's all said and done I hope that God won't ever, I won't ever hear, I'm going to make this personal, I hope that I will never hear him say, I never knew you, never knew you. You were going through the motions, you were playing church, but he never knew you. 
I, I believe intimate worship, extravagant worship is, is intimate. It's real. It's not something you do occasionally. It's not something you do only when you're going through something. It's something that you, that you breathe every day, right? Your inhale and your exhale. <laughs> It's about him. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the example you showed us in your word. We thank you for Mary's extravagant expression in acknowledging you as king, priest, and prophet and husband of the church. Help us, Lord. Purpose and be aware daily. Of how you drew us. To be extravagant in our love for you because of your love for us. So we thank you for this evening. We thank you for the words that were sown in our hearts. And we pray that every day, Lord, you would take us further and deeper into your heart's desire. In Jesus' gracious name. I pray blessings upon your children. I pray that you continue to fan this fire. Hallelujah. I pray that you stir the gift of God in every heart. that we may display your love and presence everywhere we go. In Jesus' gracious name, the Lord bless you, keep you. Amen. Amen. Love you, saints. Just a really quick heads up. I just want to let you know that, again, uh, there's Spanish service tomorrow, Thursday, right? But this Friday, we're celebrating Good Friday. And so Reverend Ben will be bringing forth the word um, this Friday. So, so, so get yourself ready. It's the day where universally the body of Christ celebrates the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then on Sunday, the resurrection. Death couldn't hold him. Hallelujah. But I think it's important for you to know that uh, from, from the day that he he passed, and then, the, of course, there's a lot of theological uh, surrounding what exact day, right? But the fact of the matter is that we're celebrating his death, but then what happens between his death and the resurrection? Because he, the Bible says he was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. What was he doing there? His body wasn't there. His soul and spirit was, right? His body was in the grave. But what happened in Abraham's bosom? What happened to those who were waiting, believing in a coming Messiah? Hmm. It's important for you to know. Amen. Just wanted to tease you a little bit. Lord bless you and keep you. Please fellowship a little bit in the back. We got a few things for you. Amen. Love you.